um, Sunday of the year. Um, a, new se- a new year begins next week because it's Advent. Don't say that too loud because it sends me into a panic. But next week is the beginning of Advent. Okay, I'm going to have to go for a lie down. No, okay. We're okay. It's, uh, so today we celebrate Christ the King, which uh, I love the theory behind and get slightly wound up by the title. Um, because this is just me having a bugbear now. This is just me whinging. But Christ is not Jesus' last name, as though his mum and dad were called Mr. and Mrs. Christ. It's a title, and it means king, which means they've called today the Festival of King the King. What's that about? I get very confused about that. Because if there's one group that should remember that Christ means king, surely it's the church. Surely we should know that whenever we read Jesus Christ, we're reading Jesus the King. And whenever we read Christ Jesus, we're reading King Jesus. And that should always kind of be in our heads, in our minds when we read it. But that being said, having a day, a year, to stop and remember that Jesus is King of all. That even in the times where the news can seem quite scary... All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. Not will be, has been. He is the king of all creation. And today we celebrate and we worship and we remember that. We come to bow the knee and remind ourselves that Jesus is king. So as we do that, let's just start with a prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for all you do. We thank you that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. And so, Lord, we proclaim that you are king of all the world. And this morning, Lord, may your kingship reign in this place. May you, through your spirit, come And remind us of your presence and rule in all of our hearts and in all that we do. May this morning be a time when your kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. We're going to stand and sing. You know how this works by now. You then have to pause while I run over there to play the guitar. So we're going to stand and sing, crown him with many crowns.
be proclaimed in and through us, now and throughout eternity. We crown you the Lord of all, now and always. Amen. Please do take a seat. So we come to our time of confession. Let's just have a moment's silence as we bring to our minds anything we want to seek God's forgiveness for this week. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn, turn away from sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith by saying together, O King, enthroned on high, filling the earth with your glory, holy is your name, Lord God Almighty. In our sinfulness we cry to you to take our guilt away and to cleanse our lips to speak your word. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So may the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. As God's forgiven people, let's declare our faith together. So let us declare our faith in God. We believe in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess to the glory of God. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. I noticed that some of the words are being missed off the screen, but never mind, you're doing a very good job of guessing what they are. Keep guessing, people. It's too late to change them. We're going to stand and sing, Jesus, we enthrone you.
yes Lord, build your throne here. May your name be praised. We enthrone you as our King, the one to whom belongs all glory and honour and power and praise, now and throughout eternity. Lord, when in our lives we fail to live with you as King, we surrender that now and ask that your kingship would build its throne in our lives and in this place. And as we worship prayer for today. God the Father, help us to hear the call of Christ the King and to follow in his service, whose kingdom has no end, for he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, one glory. Amen. Our reading today comes from John chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. need a water before I start. All right then, so Christ the King. I've already had me whinge about the name, so instead, let's just start off acknowledging here in this passage we have Jesus being accused of being a king, and what we need to realise is that the ancient people at the time of Jesus, they knew a lot more about kings than we do. They get kings. Where we have kings and queens now, you don't really kind of get absolute monarchs in the way that you used to, you know? You tend to get, well, constitutional monarchs. And these have, I mean, the queen, she can put some pressure on and she might be able to let it know that she prefers one option over the other. But let's be honest, her powers are carefully controlled they're in very tight limits and people will get quite restless if she tries to steer it onto another course that's the way it works these days now don't get me wrong of course around the world there are still people that rule in a autocratic kind of dictatorial fashion you know you only have to go look at north korea or something like that to see that these kind of things happen but what you have to realize is that in the ancient world that was the norm That's how people ruled. There was someone at the top and they were in charge. And 
kings did rule according to their whims. I mean, there were queens as well. They were few and far between. But ultimately, we're talking about Jesus, so I'm going to carry on using kings, all right? They were... They ruled according to their whims. They could promote someone or they could demote someone. They were essentially all powerful. That's how kings worked. And people at the time also knew how kings became kings. Often the crown would pass from father to son or at very least a close male relative. But the truth was that kind of bigger bigger army diplomacy tended to play a part. That's how kings became kings. One way or another, it was violence. That's how you became a king. I mean, you might be able to then establish a stable dynasty for a while, and then another bit of violence came up. And this was true in the time, where Je- in the time and place where Jesus lived. About 200 years before Jesus stands there before Pilate, you've got someone called uh, Judas Maccabeus. You may have heard of the Maccabeans. And he became king, even though he had no kind of particularly family line to become king. He, had no, he wasn't like related to King David or anything like that. But what he did have was he was in charge of a big army that managed to kick out the, uh, the Syrians. And as such, he became king. And his kingship lasted for a while. Then, of course, about, say, 30, 40 years before Jesus is standing before Pilate, that came to an end. There's another guy called Herod, who we'll hear about in a couple of weeks, because Herod the Great's in the Christmas story. The bits that are missed out in the nativity play. That's that's where Herod the Great comes in. And he's... um, He comes along because he again gets a big army and he managed to kick out the uh, Parthians. The Parthians are the great power in the east. And as a thank you, the Romans make Herod the Great king of the Jews. That's how you become king. You have a big army and you kick the other guys out and then you establish yourself as ruler. That's how kings become kings. Even our own guys, wise Queen Elizabeth on the throne, because if you go back far enough, her ancestors had the biggest army. That's literally how it works. I can't picture Queen Elizabeth herself leading an army, but you get the idea. That's how originally it happened. And of course, when Pilate is facing Jesus, and he's told by the chief priests who have handed, over, um, handed him over to them, this guy thinks he's king. This must be the idea that Pilate has in his head, right? Because that's what kings are, whether you call them kings or Caesars or whatever. That's who they are. And so when Pilate is standing before Jesus, this must be the kind of image he has in his head. But of course, what he's seeing is a peasant who stood in front of him. This poor guy who himself says he has no place to lay his head. Foxes may have holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. With a kind of rag bag bun- bunch of followers. So Pilate must kind of think, well, clearly this guy can't be king because, I mean, look at him. No army's following this dude, right? But maybe he's deluded and maybe he thinks he is a king. So I better go and ask him. And so he goes to Jesus and he says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus does the trick that he often does if you read the Gospels. He answers the question with a question. Jesus does this a lot. And so he turns around and says, who told you I'm a king? But then he goes on, he goes, look, I didn't hand you over. Here we go. You are the, that, is that your own idea? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it to be done? Then Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. 
but my kingdom is from another place. Now this is key, um, and it's important we get the translation right here. A lot of translations say things, like our own translation that I read out is, my kingdom is not of this world. Um, and a lot of people kind of, that gives the idea that somehow it's a, a very spiritual kind of other thing. That Jesus' kingdom is, is a non-physical kind of floaty place somewhere. I don't know that we've got very good language to describe that, but you know what I'm trying to say. But that's not actually what the Greek says, and a lot of translations are starting to reflect this. He actually says, my kingdom is not from this world, which is a different thing altogether. Because Jesus' kingdom is for this world, it's just not from this world. Because how do kingdoms from this world come? They come through violence, which is why Jesus says, if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. If my kingdom was the kind of kingdom you get from this world, then my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. But my kingdom isn't from this world. It's a different kind of flavour of things. I mean, even in in John's gospel, the world actually kind of denotes, if you go through, it's one of the things he says quite a lot, that the world, it it means it's the place of evil, it's the place of rebellion against God. And so Jesus' kingdom, its origin is not this worldly. It's, It's a different quality of kingdom altogether. But Jesus isn't denying that his kingdom is destined for here. And that's actually the whole point. That's why he says he came into the world. It's why he teaches his followers to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because Jesus' kingdom comes in a different way. Not through violence. It doesn't come in the way of Pilate. If you stand, if you were there and you saw this scene, Pilate is the one dressed in finery with an army at his back. And Jesus is the one dressed as a peasant, betrayed and abandoned by his friends. What does that kingdom look like when it comes into the world? We know what the, Pilate, what the kingdom of Pilate and Caesar and Herod looks like. But what does it look like when the kingdom of Jesus breaks in when the kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven well we can see it in the world in which Jesus was born it was obvious to everybody that the great and worthy were worthy of um, of recognition and honour The rich and the powerful, they were the ones that you honoured. They were the ones that you bowed down to. They were the ones that you noticed. And then Jesus comes, born to two teenage peasants, whose first bed is a feeding trough, who lived in rags and had no place to lay his head, who died, convicted, beaten, Bleeding, abandoned, and shamed. In the world of the first century, it was clear to everyone that Herod or Caesar, they were the ones that you sympathise with. Everybody knew that. Because it was obvious that God or the gods had blessed them. Otherwise, why would they be so powerful? But then Jesus comes... And slowly, but surely, people start to have their eyes opened to the idea that the disgraced, rejected peasant was God himself. And from that moment, slowly, almost unnoticed, not like a pilot coming in with his army, but like a Jesus standing as a peasant, Almost unnoticed, people start to think, well, maybe 
If God can come like that, then maybe the poorest and the most needy and the most rejected, maybe they're worthy of recognition and dignity. And from that, you get ideas like democracy and third world aid and the welfare state. Your kingdom come, your will be done. It, this is the kingdom coming, unnoticed, and yet transforming the world. And it's so in our bloodstream that we think it's just normal. It's not. Throughout human history, it has not been normal. Why do you think this, uh, these kind of things arose in the Christian West? In Jesus' day, it was taken for granted that some people were slaves, owned by others, exploited, treated as nothing more than property. And then Jesus came, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Then slowly, people started to question, if God died the death of a slave then what does that mean for people trapped in slavery? And slowly ideas begin to change. Sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back. Sometimes it goes in great leaps with people like Wilberforce and the Clapham sect and people like that. But slowly it changes. The kingdom comes on earth, is in heaven, so that now it seems obvious to us that slavery is wrong. It hasn't seemed obvious to the vast majority of people throughout history. The kingdom comes. In Jesus' day, it was taken for granted that if you were ill, you could either afford medicine or you couldn't. And if you couldn't, then tough. You died. And then the Son of Man comes and heals those who are sick, welcomes the poor and the outcast, and slowly ideas change. Do you know it's Christians who set up the first hospitals? It's monasteries and nunneries that run leprosy houses. Why do you think it's called St. John's Ambulance? You name it, it's us. It's you, if you want some good books on this, by the way, I recommend um, Tom Holland, and not Spider-Man, different Tom Holland. Tom Holland, the historian, has written a book called Dominion, who talks about how all the things that we take for granted and just think are normal come through this. Or John Ortberg wrote a book called Who Is This Man? Another one that talks about how it starts. These ideas start with Christianity. How about uh, this philosopher? A philosopher called Mark Nelson says this. If you asked what is Jesus' influence on medicine and compassion, I would suggest that wherever you have an institution of self-giving for the lonely and for practical welfare for the lonely, schools, hospitals, hospices, orphanages, for those who will never be able to repay, this probably has its roots in the movement of Jesus. This is King Jesus coming, not through violence, but through his people. I could keep talking about education. Why do you think the university started with the church? I could talk about women's rights. For there is no free or slave, there is no male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. First person to ever say that, St. Paul. I could talk about marriage. 
I could talk about interfaith, rela- uh, interfaith relations, seriously. Where do you think the idea that we should respect and welcome the other comes from? This is all the kingdom of Christ coming on earth as it is in heaven. And we've switched off from it because it just feels normal. And we need to switch on to it again because we have bought in in the West to the idea that our faith is private so you can believe what you like so long as you keep it to yourself but that's not the way it works it never has been it never should be your faith is personal don't get me wrong but it ain't private you there's a good kind of evangelical phrase that says something along the lines of either jesus is god of all or he isn't god at all (laughs) And so you may have heard that. And I agree with it. But it's often used to say, therefore, it means that you should definitely live your whole life. You should, by the way. Definitely live your whole life with Jesus as king. But it's more than that. If Jesus isn't king of our economy, well, then he's not king, is he? If he's not king of our, I don't know, our our politics, then he's not king. Jesus is king of our immigration policy. What does it mean if we believe that Jesus is king of our immigration policy? What does it mean if we believe that Jesus is king of our um, foreign policy? What does it mean if we believe that Jesus is king of our education systems? What does that mean? What does it look like? I don't know all the answers to this, but it's a legitimate question. What does it mean? if we allow Jesus to be king of all these areas. Because we should. And we should be unafraid to proclaim that he is, which is very scary in today's Western world because we're told you can believe what you like as long as you don't do anything about it. But Jesus is king. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. But this kingship does not come, and this is key when I'm talking about how we bring this kingdom to the world. This kingdom does not come in the way of the world. It does not come through swords or guns. It does not come with dictatorial power. It comes in the way of Jesus, slowly and surely, through the way of love and service and self-sacrifice and care This is the way that the kingdom of Jesus always has come and always should. It's the way of the world. The kingdom comes through God's people, the body of Christ on earth, us, the light on the hill. Like yeast in bread, like light into a dark room, the dawn coming. So today is the day we remember that Jesus is king. He's king of us, all of us, every area of our lives, including those bits where we don't really want him to be. And if we choose to follow him, we need to acknowledge that and try our best to let him be king in all those areas. But he's also king of our economy and our education system and our medical profession. He's king of our foreign policy and our political systems and our family lives. He's the king who comes, often unnoticed, to bring light and love and compassion wherever we call him. Because his kingdom is not of this world. But it is for this world. May your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth. As it is in heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God we thank you. That your kingdom does not come via sword and violence. But your kingdom comes slowly through love and service and self-sacrifice. We thank you that while your kingdom is not of this world, it is for it. 
And we pray, Lord, that you would help us as your people to see afresh how we bring your kingdom into our world. How we speak up for your authority to be recognised in all spheres. And forgive us for the ways that we have failed. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a new song. Um, the words were just too perfect to not do. You won't know the words, but you will know the tune. Because the tune is Abide With Me. Okay? So let's see how we do. Let's stand.
Let's pray. Dear Lord, you sent your son as the servant king whose kingdom is one of service, suffering and humility. A king who rules not through violence and might, but through love and care. Remind us, Lord, that we should also love and care for one another and through doing that, serve you. Today, as we remember that you are king of all, we pray for our leaders, for all who are in positions of responsibility, whether that be in the church, the government, business, or in any sphere of influence. We ask that they may make wise decisions for the good of all people. May they keep in mind their responsibilities in all they do and the decisions they make. We particularly pray for your guidance in areas of the emergence from the pandemic, both here in our own country, in Europe and across the world. And we continue to pray for leadership in the area of climate change. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Truthful God, we pray for those who hunger for justice and peace. Help us to stand beside them. We pray for our neighbours who are caught up in conflicts. We pray for our neighbours who are fleeing from danger and are finding themselves refugees and asylum seekers. We pray for our neighbours who are wrongly oppressed or wrongly imprisoned, especially those who are imprisoned for their faith in you. We pray for our neighbours whose lives are blighted by natural disasters or poverty. We pray for our neighbours who are victims of terrorism or hate crime, especially in light of the news recently. Bless those who work to bring relief to our neighbours. Help us to show the same compassion and generosity and remind us deep in our hearts when we watch the news that they are our neighbours. We ask for peace in our world. We ask for your healing in our world. We ask for your kingdom to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering in our own community. We think of people who have lost their jobs or who are anxious about money. We think of those who have no homes or no friends and family to support them. We pray for the work that happens here. We pray for our food bank and all those who receive food through it. We pray for our elderly daycare, both for our staff and our clients. May it be a place of love and support. We pray for our Meals on Wheels service, for our mental health resources. We pray that this would be a place where your kingdom is manifest. We also pray for the work of the St. Swithin Centre on Eastmore that our sister church, St. Andrews, helps run. May it also be a demonstration of your love in that place. And ultimately, Lord, we pray for an end of all the suffering, of all the poverty. We pray for your kingdom to come. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for those who are thirsty for human kindness. We pray for those who feel isolated or lonely. We pray for those in care homes. We pray for those who are missing loved ones. We pray for those who are in difficult relationships. We pray for those who are struggling with mental health problems. Lord, give us eyes and hearts to seek out the lonely and to be a refuge for those who are abused or suffering so that they may be refreshed in you. May we be a sign of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Caring God, we pray for those who are sick in body, mind or spirit. We give thanks for the care that they receive through friends, family or caring professionals. We name in our hearts those known to us now who we particularly want to lift before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. we stand to sing.
Yes, Lord, we proclaim you in all your splendor. You are the great and awesome God to whom all honour and glory and power belongs. We bow at your throne and proclaim you Lord and King now and forever. Lord, you and you alone to belongs all authority and power. So as we prepare to leave this place, help us to go remembering that you go with us, the one who is Lord of all. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please do take a seat. All right, notices. Um, first thing to say, um, thank you people that have started bringing presents, that's wonderful. Um, if you haven't heard about this, um, Vision Wakefield, so that's a group of church leaders across Wakefield of different denominations and so on. We've been doing various things together. And one of the things we've been, um, we're planning is a big party for the various um, refugees and asylum seekers that are in Wakefield. We're a city of sanctuary, so we, we have quite a lot in Wakefield. Um, so we're holding a big party at the cathedral um, for Christmas, and quite a few of them are families, so we want to make sure that all the children get Christmas presents. So um, we are asking people to buy Christmas presents. Maximum spend £10, just because we're trying to keep it you know, sensible. Um, and they do need to be wrapped and then you need to label this is the new news you see they need to be wrapped and they need to be labelled either boy or girl so that's the first thing and then age so it's either 0 to 5 or 6 to 11 does that make sense? so that's the, that's the aim boy and girl 0 to 5 or 6 to 11 and then we'll know roughly who we can give those various presents to. If you've already bought presents, thank you, I can pick them up, I can sort out wrapping and what have you, it'll be fine. But if you come with new presents, please do wrap them and just label them with that information, please. Um, and if you need reminding of what the age groups are, just give us a call and I'll let you know. Zero to five, six to 11, boy or girl. Right, that's the first notice. Uh, second notice, just to let you know, I got mad. If, if your wife starts mouthing something at you, start panicking. What, what have I forgotten? Um, <laughs> she's now looking embarrassed. I'm going to be told off later. Right. Um, the, okay. The morning of the 19th of December. That, so Christmas is on a Saturday. So that's annoying. But anyway, never mind. It's fine. It's only annoying if you're a vicar, right? It just makes everything awkward. But anyway, never mind. Christmas is on a, on a Saturday. So the Sunday before Christmas, which will be the 19th of December, will be a carol service. So we're going to have a carol service as our Sunday morning worship on the 19th of December. Okay? Then on Christmas Eve, we're going to, try, we're going to have a family carol service. That's for everyone. I'm not saying a children's family service. It's a family carol service. That means... It's for everyone in the family, just to make that clear. So do come along, we'll sing some carols, we'll, uh, we may well do something with the crib, we haven't quite figured it out yet, but it's going to be fun, come along. We'll light candles, sing songs, lovely jubbly. Maybe if I'm feeling really, really confident with COVID, we may well even have some mince pies and mulled wine or hot chocolate or something like that, okay? So come along on Christmas Eve. If you, I know people travel, but if you're around on Christmas Eve, come along. I want to tell you the time, but to do that, I'm going to have to look in the diary because I can't remember. Three o'clock. So three o'clock on Christmas Eve, that will be carol service. Then on Saturday, Christmas Day, at 10 o'clock, will be Christmas Communion. That's 10 o'clock, Christmas Day, Christmas Communion here, right? Then just to be really awkward, Boxing Day is a Sunday. So we will have a service on Boxing Day, but it will be a joint service with St. Andrew's. It'll be held here 
a 10.30 on Boxing Day. I, me and Kathy are lacking faith. We kind of feel that Boxing Day may be a quiet day. But um, prove me wrong, yeah? <laughs> Come along. So that'll be a joint service. Then the week after, which is the 2nd of January, I think, there'll be another joint service here. So that's both Boxing Day and the 2nd of January will both be joint services. Because again, we're, you know, prove us wrong, but we reckon the 2nd might be quiet. Then we're back to normal running of things. All that makes sense. There will be leaflets and stuff going out, but they need to be printed off. I've made the leaflets and not printed them off yet, but they'll be out soon. Okay? I don't think I've forgotten anything, anything else. But she's still mouthing at me. Go on. We just want to thank everyone for buying the cakes last week for children in need. We managed to raise £173. There you go. I should also... Um, the, the, the girls made them, but they were also performing in a show that week. So on the Saturday night, I should, my, my mum was visiting that weekend with her friend Linda. Um, and they both, I mean, I came home from dropping these off to the show and it was like some sort of professional bakery going on in my kitchen. It was like a well-oiled machine. So if they're watching, thank you both for sticking around. They thought they were coming for a holiday. Well, no. Get in there and make cakes. And they did it without complaining, so thank you very much. The only thing I had to do was yell out what was going on in Strictly from the other room. <laughs> so and so were on. They'd run in, watch the dance, and then run back out again. They got 32. <laughs> so there you go. That was, that was my job. Um, but the only complaint I had is they made exactly the right number. So once you'd all had any, there were no cakes left. I got no cakes. Yeah, I got a bit of banana loaf and some flapjack that could, would, couldn't hold its shape. It was still so gooey that you pick it up. Anyway, there you go. Still tasted good. Still had it. Right. That's got nothing to do with notices. I get distracted so easily. Right. I think that's all the notices. Brilliant. In which case, let's have our final blessing. Christ, our exalted King, pour upon you his abundant gifts and bring you to reign with him in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you, and all those you love and pray for, this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. Connected.